Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jack I am an alcoholic. I flew in this morning on a jet, and it was my first trip on a jet. And uh, my stomach is somewhere back there. It's on its way. <laughs> we have become very good friends, Bob and I. About two minutes uh, after the plane took off, our friendship ceased. That was it. <laughs> I don't look forward to going home tomorrow, but it is a long walk. <laughs> And I don't know really what to do except to get on the plane again and be sure and let the man upstairs know it's me. <laughs> and I got to tell him I'm not in a car this time. I'm in a plane. And look out for me. <laughs> the plane ride reminded me, or AA, I should say, reminds me of a girl who was on a plane. And she was reading her Bible. And it was some as always there, the guy with a few too many. And he came by and he looked at her and he said, uh, do you really believe what you read in that book? She said, of course I do. And he said, you mean you read about uh, Noah and the ark and you believe it? He said, if it's in this book, I believe it. And he said, you believe about Joan and the whale too? He, she said, mister... I told you once, if it's in this book, I believe it. So he said, well, how are you ever going to prove it? She said, well, I don't know. But if I ever get to heaven, she said, I'll ask Joan about the whale. And he said, suppose she's not there. He's not there. She said, well, then you could ask him. That's about the way my AA runs. And uh, now you've all had a look at me, and you still have a nice tie on, and my wife insists I bring a tie, and now that you've all seen it, to hell with it, because I can't talk with a tie on. I choke. Now there's one person out there, just only one, who was waiting to hear what I got to say. He's pretty stupid, too, but that's all right. (laughs) The rest of you can wait around for the coffee. You can't go nowhere, so you may as well just sit there quietly and listen. Um, I know that my being here, through Bob and the group, is a direct order from the man upstairs, my friend upstairs, as I call him. And there is some one person sitting out here that I'm going to help. And I don't care who likes me. If you like me good, the rest of you, and if you don't, that's just too damn bad because I'm here and you're stuck, period. (laughs) I'm going to have my say, and then I'm going to go home to New York and hope that the person who has helped will someday call me up and let me know about it. Because then I could tell my friend upstairs, you see, I'm still busy, so leave me alone for a while. (laughs) And that's the way it works. Now that I've proved to you that I'm a very funny fellow, I'm a very comical lad. I could stand up here from now until 3 o'clock in the morning and tell you jokes and have you rolling in the aisle. And it wouldn't mean a damn thing. Nothing. Because I'm an alcoholic and I'm inflicted with a disease, an insidious disease. And the American Medical Association tells me that there is nothing I can do about this disease. And he told me now that my adrenal gland doesn't work properly. And there's some malfunction in there that when I take a drink, I go haywire, chemically inside. And they say, too, that there are people that are predisposed to be alcoholics a long time before they take a drink. I was one of these people. 
Now, it just depends on how badly your chemistry is upset in your body as to how soon you're going to be an active alcoholic in trouble. Some people take a little longer. Some people spread it out a little more. Mine was not so. Mine was fast and furious. I drank early. I finished early. I almost died. So we look at alcohol today, or disease of alcoholism, I should say, and a glass of alcohol to me is a match that lights a fuse, and depending on how long the fuse is, the inevitable explosion, if you're an alcoholic. I would like to go back just a little ways and tell you how I felt as a kid to prove to you that while this disease is not inherited, it will prove to you that I have all the makeup of an alcoholic as long back as I can remember. I came from a large family, seven kids. My father drank periodically. He was an alcoholic. In those days, we called him a dirty bum. He was not an alcoholic. He was a dirty bum. And I can see now in my mind's eye that had AA be around, he probably would have been a good member. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't. <coughs> when I was a kid and my father came home drunk, I used to hide in terror. The other six laughed at him. They thought it was a huge joke when he fell down the stairs or when he took three oranges and juggled them or he put his hat on backwards and made funny faces for them. They thought it was very comical. I thought it was horrible. It scared me half to death because I didn't look at my father any which way except as to what was coming when the oranges got put down and the booze ran out because then he turned into an animal. And I knew this and I feared it. And I was always worried about my mother. I was always worried about what she was going to do and whether he would bolt that night or whether he would go to bed quietly. And I just worried and worried and worried. But consequently, I didn't go to school too often. And when I did, I was a very uh, quiet kid. Because if the teacher would have asked me a question, I was afraid to answer even if I knew the answer. Because I felt different from other kids. I felt everybody was just a little bit better than me. And everybody knew that the old man was drunk. And I was ashamed. And I was all mixed up. So when a teacher used to say to me, why didn't you do your homework? I used to say, I don't know. And then pretty soon I didn't say, I don't know. I just didn't answer. So they gave me the name of Thurley. Nasty. And my father used to say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you be like your brothers? Stand up. Don't be afraid. And I couldn't tell him that he was the one I was afraid of because when he was coming over drunk, he was just as apologetic as everyone else was. And he always promised that it never would happen again. And I used to live in hope and die in fear because inevitably he got drunk again and I was living in a dream world. Well, pretty soon the love that I should have had for my parents diminished. And I used to go to church regularly as a kid. I was taught by nuns and Christian brothers. What little I did go, I never graduated from a school because alcohol caught up with me first. But I would like to point out to you that the time that I spent as a kid my fuse was lit. My fuse was lit when I picked up my first drink. But the time before this, the distortion of the alcoholic had already set in. Because I didn't enjoy going to church. I used to go to church and light candles. And like every other kid, I used to light candles. Or maybe some kid wanted a bicycle. I didn't want a bicycle. I wanted a truck to run over the old man. Uh, and it didn't happen. So I used to look up and I'd say, what the hell do you used to go in the church? 
And then it came around and they said, now if you don't stop staying home from school, now we're going to put your father in jail. And I said, fine. So I stayed home from school. <laughs> but they didn't put him in jail and I was bitterly disappointed. I was disappointed all my life. And then something happened at the age of 12 that makes me know today. Of course I didn't know then, but I know today what it was. My brother and I went into the bedroom. We were chased into the bedroom because the old man was doping out the ponies. Now, I don't know whether you know what doping out the ponies is. I guess they have race tracks over here, don't they? Well, anyway, he was sitting in the kitchen figuring out the scratch sheet. He wanted to find out which horse was going to lose his two dollars for that day. <laughs> so, <laughs> my mother said to him, me, take your brother and get in the bedroom and keep quiet. You see, always, everybody always told me, keep quiet, shut up, sit down, keep your mouth shut. And don't say anything. And I was boiled up inside. So I went into the bedroom and I told her in a very fresh manner, I said, what, what do we have to always go into the bedroom for? Why do we have to be quiet? Why can't we be like other people? She said, because he's figuring out the horses and you know what's going to happen. And if he gets drunk tonight, it's going to be trouble. I knew this too well. And I said, well, if we don't bother him and he wins, he's going to get drunk. And if we don't, we do bother him and he loses, he's going to get drunk anyway. So win or lose, he's going to get drunk. So she said, shut your mouth and get in the bedroom. So I shut my mouth and I got in the bedroom. And my brother was a nosy little kid. And he's still a nosy little kid. <laughs> Only he was rooting around in the bedroom there. It was raining out. We couldn't go out. And he'd come up with a gallon of wine. And he said, hey, Jack, let's have a drink. So I said, sure, why not? And my brother took a drink of wine. And he gave me the same bottle. And I took what I thought was a drink of wine. But it wasn't. To me, it was battle courage. And the first drink I had separated me from my brother right there. Because when that thing went down and hit my toes and curled him up, I said, my God, no wonder the old man is always drunk. <laughs> what a wonderful thing. If God made anything better than that, he kept it for himself. <laughs> And when my brother come along, he said, Jack, let's have another one. I said, by all means, let's do. <laughs> so we had two. And then my, I said to my brother, let's have another one. He said, no. He said, you're going to get sick. It's too sweet. And I said, this stuff can't make you sick. This is the nectar of the gods. And I kept sipping on that thing all afternoon because I was not drinking wine. I was drinking a chemical, alcohol. And that alcohol was taking a place in my system what was missing chemically because of the chemical imbalance. But I didn't know, as I know today, that while this thing, chemical of alcohol, does replace momentarily what's missing, that when the alcohol is absorbed, it produces twice as much of a law. So we need two drinks to take the place of one, and then we need four to take the place of two, and then we need eight to take the place of the four, and so on it goes. This is the disease of alcoholism accepted by the American Medical Association, Toronto Medical Association, and the World Health Organization. If it's good enough for those smart people, it's good enough for me. Because I know that this is what happened to me. I only wanted in this world one thing. I wanted to live with my mother in a little house in Jersey. That's all I wanted. I said, someday, Ma, when I get big, I'm going to have kids. And you and me are going to go on to Jersey. I'm going to buy a little house and we're going to live there. And she said, yeah, okay, Jack. And that's all I had in my mind. No violence, no nothing, until I picked up that drink. So at the age of 12, I found out that I could be like other people if I had a drink. So from that moment on, I was never without a drink, whether it be beer, wine, alcohol, 
any shape or form. I had to have it. And then a strange thing happened. All the hate that I had built up over the years as a kid started to manifest itself. And now I was belligerent. And I would tell my father, drop dead for yourself. I wouldn't go in the corner and shut my mouth no more. I was ten foot tall. I was looking for trouble. And all these people, all these normal people that had gone on for years making little of me, I would fix them. Well, I fixed them. I fixed them good. Because I drank. And the more I drank, I started to get into trouble. And the more trouble I got in, the more I figured, well, this guy up there has really given me a bad shake. And I became a very vicious, nasty character. Well, I was out at 15. I was driving a car for a bunch of stick-up artists in Greenwich Village in New York on the west side. At the age of 16, my mother, who I adored and always wanted to be near, came home and found me threatening my father with a 38. They found a load of money on a table that was stolen and a bottle of whiskey and me drunk, and she threw me out of the house. She said, take your money and your whiskey and your gun and get the hell out of here. We don't need you. You're not one of us. You're some kind of an animal. Now I was really hurt. I took out on my own at 16, and I wound up in a lot of trouble. I wound up in a great deal of trouble. I have had more trouble than enough for six people. I have done everything in this world that a human being could do and still live. And I'm only living but for the grace of God. Because I was an animal that was cornered. Through alcohol, I couldn't put it down. And every morning when I got up, I was nothing. I was scared stiff. And I had to run for the battle to get me some more courage to operate. And the minute I got it, I operated good. I forgot about the pain of the night before. And the world was my oyster. The hell with everybody and hooray for me. Church, I laughed at it. I cursed the higher power. I cursed my mother for bearing me. I cursed everybody that I came in contact with because I thought I was getting a dirty deal. My other six members of the family were living nice lives, working well, and I was the outcast. I couldn't see anyone. I couldn't go near anyone because I was always hot. I was a pretty a stupid fellow. We have only one requisition, requisite in our group. You must be stupid. When you come into our group, you have to be stupid. And we tell you right to your face. Get stupid. Sit down and shut up and get stupid. Take the cotton out of your ears and stuff it in your fat mouth. <laughs> And you know, this works very well. But some people get a little perturbed, to say the least. <laughs> and we tell them, go out and get drunk and come back, if you're lucky. Because we know we got a closed corporation. They know other place to go. And the smart ones are on the outside knocking their brains out. And we stupid ones sit up there and we look at each other and we have a good time. <laughs> we enjoy ourselves, really we do. But you see, it wasn't always like this. I was a smart guy. Let me tell you how smart I was. They thought I was a pretty clever boy shaking down the Greeks on the west side. I don't have to be worried about here because I was never in Cleveland. I hope. I can't guarantee you, but I don't think so. Anyway, it's a long time. But down the west side, New York, when they used to see me coming, everybody left. Because I was bad news. And I had to shake down the poor Greeks up there, and I was doing pretty good. And I was sticking up joints, and I thought it was a wonderful sport. I mean, I, I enjoyed this tremendously. Uh, work, that was for horses and fools, and I didn't look like either. <laughs> so I used to walk into a bar and ask for a beer, and I'd give the man a buck, and when he went to get my change, he'd come back. I used to show him what the wrong end of a 38 looked like, see? And I'd say, hey, buddy, you made a little mistake. I gave you a $100 bill. 
And he used to say, yeah, I guess you did. <laughs> and I used to think that this was a wonderful life. And if you made about six or seven stabs like this a night, you're doing pretty good. So you could be a big shot down the corner. You see, go around, close the door and drink. You pay. Everybody drinks. Real big deal. But let me tell you something. I got so stupid that I was setting up crap games for the mafia there in New York. And I was setting up card games and crap games. And a couple of times I went back and stuck up the same games I had started. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was not bad enough the cops were chasing me, the robbers were chasing me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I figured I'd better get the hell out of here. So I went to Washington. And I got in trouble. I went to Norfolk, Virginia, and I got in trouble. I went to Florida, I got in trouble. So I went up north to Massachusetts, I got in trouble. I went to Maine, I got in trouble. So I figured, well, what the hell, I might as well go overseas. So I got a job as, a, as a, an engine man down on a tanker. And I started to sail around the world. Well, I had a ball. I seen, I went to every country that you could possibly take a ship into, I've been there. And I always saw the same thing. The inside of the jail or the inside of the hospital, one. That's all I've ever seen. I'm a very widely traveled person. I've been to Egypt eight different times. Eight different times in Egypt. And you know, I have an affinity for pyramids and mummies and those sort of things. I love uh, archaeology. And every time I went to Egypt, I say, now, Jack, get a hold of yourself there, boy. You get over there and see the pyramids. That's always been what you wanted to do. And I'd say, okay, Jack. I used to talk to myself because, you know, nobody else would talk to me. <laughs> so, this last time I went there to see the pyramids, they, I en ended up in disaster every time. But this last time I said, I got it made. I'm going to do it this time if it kills me. So I went into a bar in Cairo and I had a few drinks. Now my pattern was this. I never wanted to get drunk. I just wanted to take two drinks and go home like the other guy. All I wanted. I didn't want all this garbage that I had. I wanted to just go in take two drinks and say, thank you, boss, and then walk out. And I used to go there prepared to do that, and I used to fight for it. And then when the second one went down, or after the first one went down, I knew that I was like my father, and I said, it can't be. I can't live like this. I got to take two drinks to prove I'm a man. So this time I went there full of determination, into the bar in Cairo, and had my two drinks, same thing happened. I said, you're not going to leave here. You're not going to see the pyramid. I said, you're stuck. You're just like your father. And I didn't like it a bit. Only this time I ate up my sleeve. I said to a soldier, American soldier that was standing next to me. I said, hey, buddy, uh, you got a vehicle outside the door? He said, yeah, I got a Jeep. I said, good, I'll buy it from you. How about that? And he said, okay. And... <laughs> I don't know where we came from, but I'm going to meet him someday. I got to. He's going to be in AA. Well, he told me a United States Army Jeep. <laughs> so I threw a case of booze in the back, and I started out across the desert, and it's only 70 miles to Alexandria. And there's 3,000 square miles of desert, me in a Jeep, and one camel. And I had to hit the camel. <laughs> Right in the belly. <laughs> the poor Arab that was on his back went over the high rise and just like that. He's still running. <laughs> they come out for me and the jeep and the camel and I was the only one that went to jail down in the dungeon. That was the last time I went to see the pyramid. Now I understand the Russians are flooding the valley over there with the Aswan Dam. So I don't think I'll ever get to see them. But I've seen a lot of other things. I've seen tremendous amounts of things. 
all bad, all nasty. Because after these things happen to you, you go back and you nurse your wound, and you say, how did it happen? And you start to rationalize everything. If I hadn't done this, and if I hadn't done that, this wouldn't have happened, and now I know what to do next time. So you try again, and endlessly on and on. Well, I wound up, just to make a long story short, I wound up in a hospital ship. The war started somewhere along the line. I didn't remember when it started, or when we got into it, until one day I was in the Irish Sea and suddenly I was swimming. And I don't swim. <laughs> and uh, I asked the guy, I said, what the hell's going on? And he said, there's a war on. He said, we got torpedoed. I said, oh. <laughs> Now things were getting a little serious. <laughs> well, I said, had somebody ought to tell me about it anyway. Well, there was one door on that ship. It was the cook's door on a galley. It was made out of wood. The rest of them were steel. There was only six men got off that one. And I landed with that door. And I don't swim a stroke to this minute. Well, I think that this, for me, was the beginning of the miracle. I was not supposed to die. Some years later, I was in Marseille, and I suddenly couldn't drink myself drunk anymore. I was doing everything except pour it in my ears, <laughs> and I couldn't get drunk. And the fears that came over me were terrific. The war was practically over. We had gone into Normandy, into Sicily. I was in all those evasions because I was not a hero, believe me. The only reason that I stayed on these tankers so long was that nobody bothered me. My wife didn't know what I was. And people used to say, gee, look at him, he's going out on a tanker. I didn't want to go out on a tanker no more than a man in the moon. But it was the only place that I could take my booze and no one would criticize me. No one would say you drink too much. They were just glad to have me down in the engine room. Because you've got to admit, and nobody but an idiot would be down in the engine room of a ship loaded with 125,000 barrels of high octane gas. And I sailed those things and it didn't bother me as long as I had a drink. And people used to say to me, you tank of stuff? I say, yeah. But why do you stay there? Well, I like it. No, I didn't like it. <laughs> I was drunk. And I had to stay drunk to live. And that's the only type of a place that I could live. And this time in my phase now, the magic medicine wasn't working. And it was 5,000 prisoners of war on the dock waiting for transportation back. And I said, there to cause all my trouble. And I was drinking and drinking. I was getting sober by the minute. And I said, if only I could get a hold of two of them guys, just two or three, we'll all go out together in a big splash. And then an air raid started, and I went into the cage with them. Now, these were German SS elite troops that they had picked up, hardcore Nazis. And I told the soldier that with that, said, open the gate, I'm going in there. He said, you get killed. The black guy, I said, don't worry about me, worry about them. So I went in, and I remember getting two of them by the throat, and another one on the floor, I had my heel on his throat, and I was doing pretty good. I was doing real handy. I had their tongues out anyway. <laughs> and some of them got behind me, and the lights went out. Fourteen days later, I woke up. I was on a hospital ship coming into New York. And I asked the doctor, what happened? And he said, I don't know, kid. I just got you as a passenger. We're going to dump you up in New York and throw you in a hospital. I had a broken leg, a broken arm, 13 broken ribs, double broken jaw, fractured skull, and my nose was all over my face. And this is the sight that come home to my wife. And she said, what happened? I said, don't talk about it. <laughs> it's people like you that lose ships. <laughs> She assumed to this minute, I imagine, that I was torpedoed again. <laughs> I wasn't torpedoed, that was booze. 
Put me in a hospital and I was thrown out in 23 days for drinking too much. I used to hobble out on crutches down to the bar in the corner and drink. Come back and bring a bottle with me. I had the doctors and nurses drunk one night. <laughs> this is the way alcohol took me. Now I was home and she said to me one night, she said, you know something? You're not a hero. I said, no, what am I, honey? She said, you're a drunken bum. You're an alcoholic. Well, I wanted to shove her out through the window. I wanted to kill her. Because here again now with my father. And don't you call me an alcoholic. It's all right to call me crazy. Don't call me an alcoholic. So I chased her around the house with a butcher knife. And she got out. And then she sent back two cops. Well, this was my first trouble with cops locally. But it wasn't the last. Because I said to them, get the hell out of the house. And they said to me, you come with us. I said, you make me. So they did. <laughs> and they weren't at all gentle. Not at all. And when I got through with them, I didn't go to jail that night. I went to Kings County Hospital in a straitjacket because I wanted to kill a cop. So I was a cop fighter. I wound up then with three more fractured skulls. I had my jaws broken about eight different times more. I had my nose broken so often the last time I went to the doctor. Uh, he said, you know something, Jack? It looks pretty good. Why don't we leave it that way? <laughs> so now I just leave my mouth open and everything is fine. It's fine. And then there came a day that I could count eight different trips to Kings County Hospital in a straitjacket. And two different trips to Bellevue Hospital in a straitjacket. All time for the same thing. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I was going to fight anyone that called me an alcoholic. Priests came to me and begged me, please don't drink so much. Drink just a little bit. And I used to say, get out of here, you crumb. Take yourself a walk. Who the hell are you talking to, me? Do you know what's bothering me? Can you tell me what's bothering me? He said, of course not. I said, well, then get lost. And go save somebody that needs saving. Don't worry about me. I can take care of myself. I chased priests because they didn't know what they were talking about. And they never helped me in my life. And I chased psychiatrists. And I chased psychologists. I run them all. Because no one knew when they asked me to stop drinking that they were taking away my very breath. I couldn't live without it. And for a person to come to me and say, stop drinking, was telling me, stop breathing. I said, what, are you all crazy or what? Are you all stupid? Don't you see the condition I'm in and you begrudge me a drink? And my wife said, you're going to kill yourself. I said, good. Better than to live with you. <laughs> Better and live with anyone. Why don't you just leave me alone? I was so full of hate and venom because now I couldn't even borrow a gun. And I couldn't get a job. I couldn't do nothing. And everybody was on my back. The doctors, the priests. And then finally one night she said to me, come on with me. I said, I can't go nowhere. I need a drink. She said, I'll give you a drink if you come with me. I got two drinks to get on a subway, and I almost died. And then I got two drinks to get off a subway. And I said, where the hell are we going? He said, never mind, come on. So I went, and I went into an AA meeting. And I sat in the back. And I said, what kind of a joint is this? They look like a bunch of nuts. And she said, shut up and listen. So I listened. And it was some jackass up here like I am tonight. <laughs> And you know what he said? Here I am. She said, this is the answer to all your prayers. I said, I don't pray. You pray. She said, this is the answer. This is what you need. AA. I said, so tell me something. And this guy told me. You know what he told me? He said, don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. <laughs> yeah. And I thought. And I was shocked. 
I said, what'd he say? <laughs> what is he, a comedian? <laughs> That's the funny part, right? Who is he talking to? I'll kill him if I get close enough to him. <laughs> Don't take the first drink. How the hell can you get drunk? I had the answer, but I didn't want it. So I beat the cops out of there by about two minutes. I wrecked the joint. I said, you dirty crumb, all the way from Brooklyn to New York to listen to this jerk. Here I am taking ships across the ocean. Me in the engine room. Of course, I didn't know where I was, but I took them across. <laughs> I was a big deal. And this bum said, don't take the fight you and you will get drunk. I'll kill him. So I went out. What a thought he did. Up until this point in my life, I had no trouble. It wasn't trouble to me. When the cops begged me, okay, you win. No fight. But they caught me for a legit bit. I'll wait till I get out. Then it's my turn. Then we play again, cops and robbers, right? And if I caught them, it was their turn. So I was well prepared to pay at any time. And I didn't mind the arrest didn't bother me, because I figured this was a way of life. And then I came to a point where I did have trouble, what I consider trouble. So I would like at this point to point out to anyone that might be here new, but don't wait until you have done what I did, not necessary at all, because what you consider trouble may not be trouble for me, and what I consider trouble may not be trouble for you. So you take your inventory, I'll take mine. All this garbage up until now was not trouble. My trouble came when I was taken out of Kings County Hospital once, the last time. And I was taken, instead of being turned loose, I was picked up by two dicks. And they had a stop order on me, and they took me down before a judge. And my wife was there, and there was a cop, and then my two children. And I stood there, and I was very sassy. And the judge said to me, how do you feel, Jack? I feel fine. I feel wonderful. And you know something? I was a big fat liar. Because in my stomach, I had ice water. I was scared stiff. But I wasn't going to tell nobody about that. That was my business. Don't nobody look behind my alcoholic wall. Take a look over here. You see, I do magic. I feel one way, but I make you think I feel this way. And nobody knows the difference. They look over here, and I die over here. And I died that morning. But I wasn't about to ask for anybody's forgiveness or help or anything else. I'm an alcoholic, remember? I have a very insidious disease. So I stood there, and the judge said to me, How do you feel, Jack? He called me by my first name. He knew me well. I have a record of arrest that total over 125. Over 125. I got tired counting one night. My, my wife said, oh, what the hell is the difference? That's enough to get you into AA. Let's quit and go to bed. <laughs> she was very happy to take my inventory. So, 125 arrests. And you know something? About three quarters of them, I was glad to get in. I was glad to get in, to get off the street. Because then I felt a little security when that thing went bang behind me. But this time I was standing, I was scared. And he said to me, I have a little news for you, Jack. I said, you generally do. Yes. And I said, he said, this time is a little different. He said, we've had an extensive report on you from three doctors. And I said, them are the guys up there with the white coats that make me put the little round blocks in the little square holes? <laughs> and he said, yeah, the same one. I said, well, they're crazy anyway. So I said, I don't much be interested in what they have to say. So he said, but we are. And he said, I think you better listen. So I said, listen, I will, because you generally have the last word. So I listened. And when he started talking, I turned around to see who he was talking about. And I asked him. I said, who are you talking about? He said, you. I said, that's not me. And it wasn't me, actually. It wasn't the me 
before 12 years of age, before I picked up my first drink, this was not the kid that wanted to go and live in Jersey with his mother. This was nothing like this. My mother had died. And she never saw me sober. All she saw me was headlines in the paper. Cops coming in, in the middle of the night pulling me out of bed. And me hiding under the bed full of blood. And her telling cops I wasn't home. Hadn't gotten in yet. And then me going out the window. That's all my mother ever knew of me. If she had died, now I was up before the judge. And he said, this is what the doctor say about you, kid. He said that you're a homicidal maniac. Now you might wipe your family out overnight and not know you did it. And it said also that I w it was physically impossible for me to tell right from wrong. And it also said that I wouldn't live five years. And if I did live five years, that the last part of the five years would be in a mental institution with a wet brain. And it said I was positively incapable of ever doing another day's work in my life. And I said, who are you talking about? He said, you. And I couldn't believe that. And now when I think back, I can believe it. Because I remember the day I went into a bar and a guy accidentally hit me. He accidentally hit me, one hit someone else, and I fell off the stool. I wasn't hurt. But I was so mad that this guy would do this to me that I come up with a steel bar stool. And to this minute, I can hear his head when it crunched. And I was three weeks in the tombs waiting to see whether he lived or died. And the pitiful part is that the judge was right. I just didn't give a damn. He hit me first, and whatever I did was all right. So I stood there in court that day, and I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, well, we're not going to lock you up no more. It doesn't do you any good. He said, but I want you to do one thing. And get out of Brooklyn. And don't come back to Brooklyn. I was mortified. Who the hell ever got thrown out of Brooklyn? <laughs> I said... Anybody can go there, he said, but not you. And I was lost. So he put me on a subway. My wife went home with my two kids. And about two and a half weeks, three weeks later, I was on the Bowery in New York. And I lived on the Bowery in New York for the next two and a half years. Now, if anybody here wants to know what the Bowery in New York was like, I'll tell you all about it. Not now. But after the meet. It's a filthy, lousy, stinking hole. And this was where I found my trouble. Because I was doing things now that I didn't want to do. I was laying on a sidewalk and I would have cops kicking me in the ribs and telling me, hey, bum, get up. And I couldn't get up. And I used to say, if only Christ would give me the strength. Just for five minutes. So I could get up and take this fat cop with me. I'd be glad to go. And then there were times that I had to puke. And I couldn't roll over. And there were times that I was so lousy and filthy and dirty. That I could smell myself before I could see myself. And this is what the Bowery in New York is like. And I've done just about everything in my life. I've heard a lot of people. And I'm not proud of it. And I lay on the Bowery there and everything went back to my mind. And it was one thing, thank Christ, I couldn't be wiped out. And that was the pictures of what might have been. See? And every time I came to in the morning or in the night, where it happened to be, little pictures in the back of my mind. The last remaining segment of my sanity used to be pictures of my wife and kids. And I used to lay there, and I used to have to run as quick as I could and get about. I had to drink. I had to bury the pictures. I wanted them to go out completely so it wouldn't haunt me. But they didn't. They stayed with me, and I think that it carried me through. Because one day I had hemorrhage in the stomach. And it's not uh, important, but I drank everything that came with alcohol. There were 62 men died not too long ago on the Bowery. 
were 61 men and one woman. And I drank many and many a gallon of what they died from. And I drank wood alcohol. I drank Thino. I drank witch hazel. I drank anything at all that would blot out the pictures. So this is the filth and the degradation that I know. And while we're on the subject, let me say one more. Right, there were 61 men and one woman and one of the men was a Catholic priest. So if you think you're sitting out there real smug and contented and say, I think things can't happen to me, then don't you bet on it. Because I said the same thing. These things always happened to the other guy. But now I was in it. I was there. And it's a long, long way back, believe me. So I hemorrhaged you the stomach, and I damn near died. Now up until this point, I was a very nasty individual. No love of God, I hated everybody. But when my brothers wouldn't come, and my wife wouldn't spit on my hair if it was on fire, and if my sisters wouldn't come near me, they were ashamed of me. And nobody would tell me where my father lived. And no self-respecting cop would even club me anymore. That's a pretty miserable way to live. And when everything was gone, and I was about dead with hemorrhages, my wife asked me, she said, would you like to try AA again, big shot? And I said, yeah, I would love to. And I had a beard down to here. I was full of blood and filth. I had two shirts, two pants, a pair of shoes, no underwear, and no socks. And she said, I asked for a doctor. And she said, no, I'll give you a razor blade. You can cut your throat, but no doctor. And then when I didn't die, she said, would you like to try AA again, big shot? Now, this is the point in my story that my second life begins. You must listen closely to try and understand me because I'm stupid. And you may be one of these smart people. I'm stupid and I'm simple. But I know one thing. That this is a God-given, God-inspired program. I call him my friend upstairs now. But remember the condition that I was in, cursing everyone around me. And then I needed help. So I have it figured thusly. But the man upstairs sits there and he waits for we alcoholics, through our sponsors, to get the dangle of AA that he dangles in front of us through our sponsors. And when he saw me on my hands and knees, hanging in the toilet bowl, bleeding like a stuck pig, he must have been quite happy. He must have said, this guy get ready. Because it was the first time in my life when I saw myself literally running down a sewer that I said to myself, Jack, maybe you are having a little trouble with alcohol. <laughs> Because I couldn't find nothing else to blame. <laughs> and he must have said, good. And then my wife came and asked me about AA, and I believe it was them pulling the wires. Because why let my education go to waste? But well, this bum had a lot of trouble. We need him. We'll give him one more rap. So I had my one more rap. And he said, we'd better teach him good. He's an arrogant bum. I used to go around and bother and fight about being an Irish Catholic, right? I never went to church, but I was an Irish Catholic. And if you were anything else, you were here for me to stick up. That was it. <laughs> Minority group, get out of my way. Steamroller over them. I hated everybody, but Irish Catholics, at least I give you car fare. Back. <laughs> but a man upstairs teaches us lessons good. In my case, he had to work fair. 
because I wasn't long for this world. So my wife called AA. I come out of a bathroom on my hands and knees. Filthy, dirty, slovenly wrecked. Half crazy with fear. Didn't even know my own name. Couldn't talk because I had an infected mouth. And then AA came. And who do you think came? Pat Kelly? No. My friend upstairs has a very funny sense of humor. My sponsor's name is Sam Cohen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and his wife's name is Ida. And she was with him. And you know something? I cried. I said to myself, Jack, you are a dirty, rotten bum. You have never done anything in your life that was right. You have been wrong since the minute you were born. And I realized all of a sudden of all the rotten, despicable things that I had done. And I thought of how I had abused so many people. And all of a sudden I said to myself, if only I could get sober <coughs> just long enough to make amends so that when I die, people will say, well, he wasn't much, but at least he died sober. What length of time this entailed, I didn't know. In fact, I couldn't tell you day from night, night from day. But these two gentle people came and they picked me up. And I was only deathly afraid that they would say, gee, lady, it's too bad you didn't call us a couple of months ago. <laughs> I thought that they would turn around and walk out when they saw the condition I was in. But they didn't. They said, come on, kid. We'll take care of you. And they did. They picked me up as dirty as I was and as filthy. And one under each arm, they put me to an AME. When I got to the meeting, they didn't sit me on a chair. I heard one of them say, don't sit him on a chair. He might fall off and hurt himself. So they sat me on a little ledge that ran around the room that covered the water pipe or the steam pipe. It was the Hotel St. George in Brooklyn. And it was by then, by far, the most uh, elaborate meeting in Brooklyn or New York area. And everybody there welcomed me. Nobody chased me. I didn't <coughs> shave. I couldn't. And when the meeting was over, I didn't hear nothing. These two people said to me, come on, Jack, we'll take you home. And a guy come up to me and he poked a buck in my pocket. And he said, kid, do me a favor. He said, go down to the bar for Christ's sake and get yourself a drink before you drop dead. And I did. My sponsor took me into the bar. I had a dollar's weight of rye whiskey in a water glass. The bartender looked dagged at me, but my sponsor told him, don't worry about it, we'll take him out. <coughs> and that's the last drink I had. Because that night I made a decision. I made a decision that I was wrong, and these people were right, and I wanted what they had. And that was 16 years ago. So I've had 16 years of my second life. <coughs> two lives. One complete miracle. I was almost a year before I could talk. It was almost a year before I could see. I'm still blind in one eye. I still can't hear out of one ear. And I have a hell of a time sometimes. But I tell you something. I'm so full of gratitude to AA and to the higher power that there is just no, uh, nothing else in this world for me but AA. And to come to these meetings is a privilege. It's a privilege. My first year in AA, people used to come by that knew me, and they used to leave a cup of black coffee on the table where I was sitting in the back of the room. And in their kindness, they used to walk away because I couldn't pick it up. And I used to have to stoop down to it with my mouth like an animal to drink it. And they understood. And it's the first time that anyone in the world ever said to me, hey, don't worry about it, kid. We know how you feel. And they didn't tell me not to drink. 
They didn't tell me that I shouldn't drink. They didn't tell me that I was going to die in hell. Or they didn't tell me I was going to go to a nut house. They didn't tell me nothing. They said, you come with us and we'll show you how. And we'll tell you why you can't drink. Not that you shouldn't. You can. So I hung on to them for dear life because here is what I had fished for all my life in the bottom of the bottle. Understanding. And I got it. And suddenly I realized I was sober a year. And then it became two years. And then I came home one night and my wife said, uh, are you still sober, bum? And I said, yeah. Uh, we weren't living like men and wife. My kids still weren't allowed near me. I was just a boarder and I was very grateful to be there. And if the kids come to me for anything, she'd say, come away from that man. He's crazy. He might kill you. And didn't those people in AA ever find out about you yet? And don't they know what you are? I said, yeah, they did. And they know what I am. But they like me. And she said, they must all be crazy. And I said, well, why don't you come along and find out? So on her own, she started to go to AA meetings. And she learned more about AA. Now, my wife was of a different religion than I was. And five years after I came into AA, she went up to church to where I was, and she was converted. And we were married in a church. And my kids were baptized. All my big problems now were diminishing. And all I was doing was staying away for one drink for one day. My job got better. You have to save money. And then a wonderful event happened to me. I have a 10-year-old boy now. And he is a smart little boy. He's, uh, he's like me, the genius, believe me. <laughs> He certainly can't take after my wife. I gotta get a break somewhere. Now think of the beauty of the AA program in my life. I was deprived of my first two children. So my friend upstairs sent me another one. And me and him are growing up together. He's 10 and I'm 16. And we have a wonderful time. We watch the shoot 'em up. We watch Mickey Mouse. And we watch the Flintstones. And we go fishing, only we don't go fishing, we go out and drown wings. I have never <laughs> heard of that. <laughs> But we're happy. And my kid knows more about AA than a lot of people sitting in this room. And I wouldn't have it any other way. And it's been my privilege to be connected with a lot of nice people. When I was in AA a little while, I began to think, well, I came into a meeting one night and there was somebody said, there's a cop here. And I said, where is he? I'll kill him. <laughs> and he told me, Jack, we don't do it that way no more. <laughs> and I said, oh. And I said, just keep the bum away from me because I hate them. And then you know something? I soon learned that we were in AA because we were alcoholics, not because we were cops or robbers. So now we have up there what we call the cops and robbers group. Seventeen cops and seventeen robbers. <laughs> and I'm in the middle. I keep them separated. <laughs> Sometimes we get a cop that is a robber, but we have to put him back with the cop. Because... <laughs> and we can't get more of one than the other because they get nasty. <laughs> Their ego swells up. And we have two priests in our group. And we have an Irish Christian brother. And we got a Marist brother who's the principal of a high school. Yeah. And we have a Christian brother. And we have a police lieutenant. And can you imagine this guy six foot six? A lieutenant in the police department. 
And when he walked in the door, I said, hello. He said, hello, I'm a lieutenant. I said, sit down, you're a bum. <laughs> well, that went up like a light balloon with him. <laughs> but he sat down. And every time he opened his mouth, I said, shut up and get stupid. And he got stupid. He got good and stupid. And he's so stupid that he's the best man in Mount Vernon on police department now. <laughs> and the two priests, hey, we don't care what you are. Take your collar off, hang up your coat, and shut up. You don't know nothing. But I'm a, sit down, you bum. Sit down and listen and learn. Because this program doesn't care who you are. It will bury you. And thank God they listen. So now I'm connected with the Christian brothers in a kind of an off-handed manner. I'm working out a couple of other orders, too. <laughs> they thought they had a license to drink. No. But what I would really like to say to you is that I worked for Lincoln Hall, which is a boys' institution. It's just one grade before prison. And these kids range in age from 11 to 17. Eighty-five percent of them are alcoholics. Ninety-five percent of them have fathers and mothers who are alcoholics. So if there's anybody sitting over here that tells me, well, I don't know nobody, nothing. I only drank and I hurt myself. I say you're a damn liar. Because I can prove it to you. 285 kids. And when they get out, they're mine. They belong to me. And I got to guide them back to where they came from. And sometimes the home is so bad with booze that we turn the kids loose, but we don't let them go home. We put them in foster homes. And these people still insist that they don't have any trouble with alcohol. So this is now my work. <laughs> this is where I live. This is where I hope to die, helping these kids. We have a regular AA meeting up there on a Sunday that runs for an hour. And we have about 85 children and about 60 adults from the outside, everybody the same, all alcoholics. So this program works for anyone. Your trouble is booze, it works for you. These kids printed up these things for us, and we brought them down here for you tonight. I would read it to you, but it's too damn long. So, <laughs> you take one home and read it yourself. What the hell do I look like anyway? It's too much. It's hot. I would like to tell you this. There is another little piece here the kids also printed. It says, leave the past to the mercy of God, the present to his love, and the future to his providence. And this is the way I live. These are gifts from the kids to you, in the hope that you will help them and they will help you. Uh, I could stand here all night and I don't intend to. I, I don't feel too very good tonight. But I can't leave ever without drawing you just one little picture. All my garbage, I have never been to school. I don't know much about anything. I don't know about stocks and barns. I don't know anything about anything, but I do know about booze. I damn near died for it. I died a thousand times, and I died for booze. I know where it can take you. And I say this to you. You don't have to go. You can quit anywhere along the line where you heard me reach a point because I was at that point too. I continue to drink. But I look at it this way. The men upstairs needed some of us to be horrible examples of something I don't know. So my past has been given to me as a diploma and this is my knowledge, and this is my school, 
and I put it to good use. So don't nobody be offended at anything I might say, because I don't know no better. All I know is one thing. I don't try to imitate me. It's not necessary. Because AA now is working so well. The people coming in don't need to go down to the Bowery. They don't have to find out what the inside of a jail looks like. It's all unnecessary. We have kids that are in AA up there 16 years of age, believe it or not. 16 years of age. We have one particular kid, uh, Bob was at his anniversary in Lee Walker, who went home from Lincoln Hall and brought his mother into AA, and between the two of them, they went out and brought the father in. And the night Bob was at the anniversary there, they were all three celebrating their first anniversary together. And this is the power of the program of AA. God-given, God-inspired program. I am not overly religious, but I have to look somewhere to put my gratitude. I have a wonderful 10-year-old boy. The boy, without a doubt, is a genius. He is a genius. We sent him this summer, or last summer, to Iona College to take an advanced course in English literature. He was then nine and a half. This kid has a mind that is fantastic. And this is what was given to me by the man upstairs. So I go home at night and I say to my friend, I say, hey, cousin, I'm pretty tired. I got a lot of problems. So I wrap them all up in a bundle and I say, here, catch him. I'll hold him till I get up in the morning. And you're going to be up all night anyway. And I'm going to sleep. <laughs> And sometimes, you know, it becomes unbearable. So I pull off the side of the road somewhere, and maybe my head is pounding like I can't, like no one knows how it pounds. And maybe I can't see. So I pull off the road and I say, hey, cousin, why don't you just get off my back for a little while? Then get on somebody else's, let me breathe. And I always breathe. And this is the way I have a close relationship with the man upstairs. He is forever sitting on my shoulder, whispering in my ear. I can't hear nothing in his ear except what he says, because that's my conscience. And when the phone rings, I have to go, because I know that I was left on this earth for one thing, to carry the message to a sick alcoholic. And this is why I almost died, and this is why I'm in AA, and this is why I have been blessed with such wonderful good fortune and good luck to carry the message to other alcoholics. And if I don't, he is liable to look down and say, come on, Jack, you're tired. Come on up. I don't want to go. I, don't. I like it here. I enjoy it. Now, let me tell you about my little son. He said to me the other day, he's a very comical little lad. He said to me today, the other day, do you know, I want to ask you a riddle, Pop. I said, okay, ask me a riddle. He said, well, you know the new Met Stadium? I said, yeah. He said, two girls went over there. And he drank a bottle of whiskey while the ball game was going on. And he finished it. And he said, now you tell me, what inning was it? And what was the condition of the game on the field? And I said, how the hell do I know? He said, well, it's very easy. It was the end of the fifth, and the two bags were loaded. <laughs> Another day he said to me, Pop, do you know what mixed emotions are? I said, no, John, what's mixed emotions? He said, well, if you were to see your mother-in-law going off a 200-foot cliff, but she was sitting in your brand new Cadillac, you would have mixed emotions. <laughs> Well, I do have mixed emotions. I have mixed emotions about those three poor doctors that condemned me to death 20 years ago or more. They figured without this guy upstairs, they figured without the higher power. And they were right. Only they left out one ingredient. 
faith and hope which AA gave me. So I came into AA. And now these doctors leave me with mixed emotions because two of them are dead. And I don't know whether to say I'm glad or I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> and the third guy, he's not looking well at all. <laughs> and every time I see him, I tell him the same thing. Doc, take care of yourself. <laughs> the normal people need you. I don't. I have what I need. Hey, hey, here. I have a new way of life. I know what to do in case of any emergency. And I go on and on. And it's a wonderful, tremendously easy way to live if you just throw in the sponge. Quit. You're fighting a sucker's game. You want to know how to stick up a drugstore? I'll tell you. Don't try it. I'll tell you about it. You want to know how to roll a drunk or crush a man's skull? I'll tell you. You want to know how to set up a crap game so you can't lose? I can do that too, yes, because this is my knowledge. But if you want to know what it feels like to go home and sleep with an easy mind and have no fear whatsoever and have a tremendous and simple faith in an unseen higher power and watch miracles happen day after day after day after day, then you surrender. You say yes. Before I knew I shouldn't drink, now I know I can drink. What a hell of a difference that makes. Well, well, I'm going to wind up here. I want to just tell you one little poem that I have a little prayer that I say in the morning. Every morning in our group, I'm going to leave some copies of it here for you too. And it goes like this, it's called The Secret. And it says, I met God in the morning when my day was at its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. And all day long the presence lingered, and all day long he stayed with me, and we sailed in perfect calmness o'er a very troubled sea. So I think I know the secret, plain for many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him throughout the day. And with that, I want to thank you all for being so patient with me. Thank you for having me here, and God bless you each and every one. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.